For more than two years, prosecutors have been building their case against Karen Reed. It's now time to go to trial. I'll bring you every detail on this alleged crime that has turned the town of Canton into near chaos. Tonight on NBC10 Boston. Simple principle. When selection gets low, savings tend to disappear. But now that there's a great selection, there are lots of great savings deals. So come to the Toyota Spring Savings Event, where you could get low 4.75% financing for 60 months on all-wheel drive RAV4 hybrid and gas models, which could save you up to $1,600. Great selection means great savings deals. At your New England Toyota dealer, your all-wheel drive headquarters. Toyota, let's go places. You're watching NBC10 Boston, news worthy of you. January 28th, 2022. It's been a long couple of days trying to forecast this thing. Now it's on top of us. With a blizzard in the forecast. Over two feet of snow, plus the tides. And warnings for everyone to stay home. To the fullest extent possible, stay off the roads. Karen Reed and her boyfriend, Boston police officer John O'Keefe, were out enjoying the final hours with friends and colleagues before the snow fell. We were happy, having fun, laughing. The pair started the night at CF McCarthy's in O'Keefe's hometown of Canton before meeting up with a who's who of law enforcement, all at the Waterfall Bar. Did you ever feel you were overserved that night, as no. they say? No, nope. But as the closing bell at Waterfall came and went, the group wasn't ready to call it a night. And what happened next has led to one of the most salacious criminal cases in recent history. A Boston police officer killed. Prosecutors say his girlfriend, Karen Reed, hit him with her car and left him for dead. But did she really do it? The Commonwealth says yes. Her attorneys say not so fast. This is Canton Confidential, the Karen Reed murder trial. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Glenn Jones. Tonight, after more than two years of waiting, filled with twists, turns, and endless speculation, so much speculation, the trial against Karen Reed has begun. Jury selection got underway today inside a packed Denham courthouse. And outside, crowds of protesters took their place 200 feet away from the building. It's a court-ordered buffer zone that the judge hopes will keep jurors unbiased, something she reminded the jury pool of this morning. People outside of this building have rights, and we know that they have voices. But this criminal trial will be decided by an independent jury, free from outside interference, based only upon the evidence presented in this courtroom and the law. Tonight, we know four jurors have been seated from a pool of about 90. But perhaps the biggest headline from today was the judge's ruling on a motion allowing Reed's lawyers to present a third-party culprit defense with some restrictions. We'll really dive into that later. It's very, very important. It's been a long road to get to today. Reed first stepped into a courtroom for her first arraignment on February 2nd, 2022. Since then, there have been countless hearings and hundreds of motions. Here's a look at how we got to where we are today. Criminal indictment 2282CR117, count one, charges of Karen Reed. The trial of Karen Reed has turned the quaint Massachusetts town of Canton into a community divided. You can't even go out to eat at a local restaurant without having folks walk in, you know, saying, oh, John, oh, Karen, oh, Kelly. Shame on you! Outside the courthouse in Denham, rallies have clearly favored one side. Inside the courtroom, two very differing perspectives about what happened between the night of January 28, 2022 and the morning of January 29th, when John O'Keefe died. Prosecutors say after the group left the waterfall bar, but before the blizzard really started, the group decided to go back to the home of fellow Boston police officer Brian Albert and his wife Nicole. John O'Keefe and Karen Reed were invited to 34 Fairview Road by Jennifer McCabe, Nicole Albert's sister. At 12.18 a.m., Mr. O'Keefe called Ms. McCabe to ask more specifically where the house was located on Fairview. While inside the residence, following her arrival there, Ms. McCabe observed a black SUV. Prosecutors say at that point, O'Keefe got out of the SUV. Reed backed into him, killing him and leaving him to die in the snow. But the defense refutes that. Adamant, Reed did not back into her boyfriend, says they have a witness who saw the defendant drive away that night. Car undamaged, and no one in the snow outside 34 Fairview Road. Brian Nagel's testimony is that he arrived just after Karen Reed arrived. He had her car in his sights the entire time. Certainly time enough for John to get out of the, the, the car and walk toward the front door. 
He said that he observed that there was no tail light damage whatsoever. And most important, he didn't see or hit anybody with, his, with her SUV. The defense theory is that Joan O'Keefe met his death inside the house at 34 Fairview, not outside. John walked into an element of hostility in that house. John O'Keefe got out of a car, walked into the house, was sucker punched, fell, hurt himself, and then ultimately his body was moved. Innuendo is not evidence. False narratives are not evidence. However, what evidence does show is that John O'Keefe never entered the home at 34 Fairview Road in Canton the night he died. That's Norfolk County District Attorney Michael Morrissey in an unusual outside of court video statement. He said no witness saw O'Keefe enter the house. Actually, Karen Reed didn't see him go in either. But the defense says technology proves O'Keefe went into the house. According to their forensic expert who examined O'Keefe's phone, Apple Health recorded O'Keefe taking 80 steps and climbing the equivalent of three floors with his location pinging in close proximity to the Albert residence. It's evidence that could support the claim O'Keefe went into the house that night. But prosecutors say the same phone's data contradicts the defense's timeline. The information the council is relying on has him going up and down three flights of stairs before he's even at the house. Uh, so for those reasons, again, uh, the Commonwealth with the submit that the defendant has not met its burden and ask that the uh, motion be denied. How many of you folks have seen the defense going after the facts the way we are and the Commonwealth conversely hiding from those facts? Rarely happens that way. There's something to that. There are some facts the prosecution has presented that haven't been challenged in court so far. On the night of John O'Keefe's death, the couple went to two bars, C.F. McCarthy's and Waterfall in Canton. Karen was driving her SUV. While still in front of 34 Fairview Road, she left several voicemails on O'Keefe's phone, screaming she, quote, hated him. The next morning, after finding his body, she repeatedly asked, did I hit him? And after being taken to Good Samaritan, a blood test showed her blood alcohol level was between 0.13% and 0.29% that night. That blood alcohol level would be higher than the legal limit for driving a car. Listen, we are just starting to scratch the surface of pretrial evidence, some of which has fueled drama, filled theories around the case. Before we talk about those, though, let's highlight some other key players. We know the victim is John O'Keefe, and Karen Reed is accused of killing him. Then there is fellow Boston police officer Brian Albert. He owned the home where O'Keefe's body was found. Albert's sister-in-law, Jennifer McCabe, she invited Reed and O'Keefe to the Albert home for an after party. And Massachusetts State Trooper Michael Proctor, he was the lead investigator in this case. He is now the subject of an internal MSP investigation in connection with the Reed case. So let's talk about some of those theories. The first being an internet search allegedly made on the cell phone of Jennifer McCabe. You see it here. According to court documents, how long to die in the cold? But of course, the first word is misspelled. This allegedly happened on Google just before 2.30 a.m. on the date in question. The next one, how, has to do with the Alberts family dog, Chloe. Court documents show the police canine German Shepherd was rehomed in the months following the incident. At one point, the defense alleged the dog may have been responsible for some of the injuries found on O'Keefe's body. And a third point of contention, the cracked taillight on Reed's SUV. Specifically, when did it break? Prosecutors say shards of glass allegedly found on Reed's back bumper link her vehicle to the scene where a broken cocktail glass was found in the snow. While testimony in the trial hasn't even begun yet, we already know so much. That's why it seems everyone has already picked a side. For months now, Reed has arrived at court to throngs of supporters holding signs and shouting, free Karen Reed. And in the age of social media, the courthouse spectacle you see here is amplified 100 times over when you go online. NBC 10's Eli Rosenberg joins us live from the Norfolk County Superior Courthouse. Eli, you've going to give us a, dig, a deep dive into the social media surrounding this case. Well, go ahead and pick up your phone, log into your favorite social media platform. You are bound to see something about the Karen Reed case. You know, this is a case and a trial that has attracted information across the board unlike any other and now a jury selection underway it started her today behind me that is creating some challenges 
You don't have to look any further than this. Karen Reed leaving court this afternoon. The crowd, the crush of media, the attention. To see Reed is not just any defendant in a murder trial. Everyone here, we're all wearing pink for Karen Reed to show our support for her. This man, you know him as Turtle Boy, one of those reasons. His blog chronicling every twist and turn of the Reed trial has gone viral, leading to online debate and division. Now with uh, social media, being able to engage and follow and literally participate. Chatter is one thing, but now all that publicity playing into picking a jury pool. The jurors selected for this trial will hear and judge the evidence. Some 90 potential jurors brought in on Tuesday. And when the judge asked if any had heard of the Reed case, some 70 said that they had. It's hard to, to be in Massachusetts and to get any sort of news feed whatsoever and to not be inundated. So it really is like a sign. For 35 years, David Davis has been a Cambridge-based jury consultant, including working with prosecutors to pick a jury for the O.J. Simpson double murder trial. Lawyers and the media often overestimate the extent to which the public actually is aware or knows about the case. I bring it to the court's attention. But Mark Garagos, you may recognize him from the Scott Peterson trial, says he always worries about a juror's real motives. My biggest worry on cases like this are uh, stealth, what I call stealth jurors. Especially in cases like this that have plenty of buzz online. In my experience, having done this hundreds of times, very few people are eager to serve on a jury. And talking about David Davis, the jury consultant there, he says in the end, a jury will be seated. The big question, though, how long does it take? For example, today, 90 potential jurors were brought in and four were seated. Both sides will be back at it again tomorrow. Ivan Dedham, Eli Rosenberg, NBC10 Boston. Okay, Eli, thank you. NBC10 Boston legal analyst Michael Coyne is going to join the conversation now. It's good to see you. Um, listen, let's talk about some of these conspiracy theories, because although many of us are caught up in them, you don't completely buy them. You say more likely than not, perhaps this was an accident at the hands of Karen Reed. How did you land in that place? Uh, the question of the evidence. What evidence supports the logical conclusion? I'm not so sure that it's a second-degree murder case. I don't see the evidence of intent that you'd need for second degree. So what you're left with really is a motor vehicle homicide. Was there reckless, dangerous behavior by uh, Miss Reed that night? I think the answer is yes. The question is, did it lead to the cause of his death? The fact is it would take too many moving parts and too much evidence that the defendant is going to have to produce now that would support this broad conspiracy to not only kill him but then cover it up. And that's the real key question, and that's what the judge has decided, even with the third-party culprit. Defense. Well, you make a good point there, but there is so much strange behavior by law enforcement that is somewhat unexplained here. Destroyed cell phones, uninterviewed witnesses. Um, how do we explain that? You can't. You can't and shouldn't. Uh, the fact is there is too much unexplained law enforcement misbehavior in this case to have anyone who's reasonable question whether they are going to be able to meet the reasonable doubt standard that they, that they carry, which is very, very high. So I don't dismiss those claims. I don't dismiss that law enforcement should have done a better job and that some folks should not even have been in that house because of their relationship with the Alberts. So the problem is the investigation is tainted on a number of different levels. The question is, will that mean that the jury finds reasonable doubt for all of the criminal charges she faces. Okay. Michael Coyne, thank you very much. It's good to have you here for this discussion. Uh, a little later in the show, we'll talk about the third-party culprit defense green-lit by the trial judge today. We're going to keep the conversation going now with Boston attorney Catherine Luftis. It's good to have you here. You may recognize her from the TikTok account, Note My Objection. So because I'm a lawyer, before I comment on anything, what I like to do is I actually like to read the legal filings. So this is these are the last three docket entries on the John O'Keefe case uh, filed by the defense. What I do is I read those, I take notes, and then I explain to you. 
This is perfect. I'm going to join TikTok <laughs> because of you. All right, hey, <laughs> I'll take you all. All right, so listen, the day began today with the judge making a ruling on a motion, which she's going to allow, with some restrictions, a third-party culprit defense for uh, the defense team. Can you explain really quickly to our audience what that is and why prosecutors did not want her to allow this motion? So what the judge ruled today was essentially what we call in legal terms is splitting the baby. So she, she declined to allow the defense to uh, present this argument in their opening statements. However, they are able to question throughout their direct testimony that they elicit any cross-examination, any evidence or documents presented. So essentially what the judge is saying is when uh, Attorney Yannetti was in the uh, courtroom on Friday, that he presented enough information, and we call it an offer of proof to the court, that there was enough evidence he anticipates coming in that would uh, justify the court allowing a third-party culprit defense. And that means somebody else did it, not our client. That's correct. That's correct. And so the defense is pointing specifically at three people and, and outlining the possibility that's Colin Albert, that's Brian Albert, and that, that's Brian Higgins. And David Yannetti on Friday outlined the specific reasons. When we talk about a third-party culprit defense, we talk about uh, the idea that you have to provide other people. There has to be evidence that there's other uh, motive, intent, and opportunity for somebody to have committed the crime. And essentially, that's what Karen Reed has been saying all along. I didn't do this. Somebody else in the House did it. They asked the court uh, to deny the Commonwealth's motion. And, and as I said, the judge basically split it down the middle by saying, you can't do it from the front end, but we'll allow some testimony as you go through. Yes, let's use the time less to talk about these third parties that have been named. Brian Albert, of course, is a Boston police officer. Colin Albert is his nephew. And Brian Higgins is also a law enforcement agent at the ATF. How could it be possible that those people would be implicated in this? Do you think do they need to prove that those people did it in order to get their, their client an acquittal? They do not have to prove that. And it's always important to remember that ultimately it's the Commonwealth that has the burden of proof. To prove that Karen Reed hit and killed John O'Keefe beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not the defendant's burden to prove that she's innocent or to prove that anybody else did it. What they're trying to do with a third-party culprit defense is present to the jury not only are we trying to poke holes in the Commonwealth's uh, reasonable doubt, but we're also presenting alternate theories that quite uh, honestly may be viable, and I think that's really what they're trying to do with this. It's going to be interesting it watching is. the testimony it in is. this case. Attorney Catherine Luftis, thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Stay with us after the break. Sue O'Connell will join our guests here in studio to talk jury selection and who might be the perfect juror in this trial. Welcome back to Canton Confidential. Sue O'Connell has joined the roundtable here, our political commentator. You were in the courtroom today watching jury selection. What were your observations? Well, it was odd because there were a lot of people there, 88 to 95, depending on how you count, when asked how many of you have heard or talked about the case. Almost all of them, the majority of them, raised their hand. How many of you already have formed an opinion? A lot raised their hand. How many of you already have a bias? A few of them raised their hand. And then the judge called them up individually uh, with the lawyers to vet them to see if they're going to serve on, on the jury. So it was a very different experience than I've been a part of as a juror and the times that I have been in the courtroom for jury selection. And Michael, knowing about the case doesn't automatically disqualify you from sitting on the jury. No, the standard is that despite what you know, are you prepared to listen to the evidence carefully in court and then rule on only the evidence presented as to her guilt or innocence. So, Catherine, we got four jurors sat today. Do you think this pace can be maintained where by the end of the week we have a panel? I I'm impressed by how quickly they sat the four. I think it's possible if the jurors and the judge are acting all efficiently. There's a number of jurors that, that were uh, um, summons for today as well as tomorrow, so I think they have a large pool to choose from, and it's certainly possible. So this trial in some ways has felt like a spectacle. Mm -hmm. Did it feel that way in person? It didn't when we were in the courtroom because it was all jurors in the courtroom and press and then of course the court for the folks working. But um, after most of the jurors had been, um, the majority, only about four were left, some of the spectators came in to watch, dressed in pink, sitting in the back row. And that kind of gave us a hint to what the trial will look like. And again, it was very controlled. I think the jurors didn't go out the front door, so there was no concerns about them being harassed. But it is starting to build up. I think they did a great job controlling the spectacle part of that within the jury selection. All right, so Michael, we're on the eve of testimony beginning, opening statements beginning. Uh, we have a parallel federal investigation. So much of this feels unprecedented. 
you've been around for a while. Is this oh, similar thanks. to anything else? That's a kind way of calling you experience. <laughs> the, closest to, the closest to it would be either an OJ trial or a Trump trial because you have nothing else that attracts the public attention and the fever that you see with these folks and the interest in the outcome. So it's been a while since we had OJ tried. It hasn't been that long since we've tried Trump. All right, Michael, Sue, Catherine, thank you very much. There's clearly a lot to this case, and this is really just the beginning. Every day the trial moves forward, we'll have a full recap with expert analysis at 7 p.m. right here on NBC10 Boston. You can also follow along on our website or catch anything you may have missed at NBC10Boston.com slash Karen Reed. We'll be right back. Before we go, a quick recap. We started the day with about 88 potential jurors. Four have been seated. The selection process will resume bright and early tomorrow morning and we'll continue to bring you every twist and turn of this incredible trial. But while this case has gained national attention and stirred all sorts of theories, it's important we remember a life was lost. John O'Keefe was a 16-year veteran of the Boston Police Department. At home, he was guardian to his niece and nephew, caring for them full-time after they lost both their parents. O'Keefe was 46 years old when he was killed. Thanks for joining us. This has been Canton Confidential. <laughs>